This AI weekly update will start by covering the annotated GPT-2, a really great blog post that goes through the GPT-2 paper, shows you what the GPT model architecture looks like, and how to implement it in PyTorch, all the way from the self-attention layers, the, the one-dimensional convolutions, the feed-forward layers, up to the transformer decoder block, then putting it all together in the GPT-2 model, and then doing an example of with pre-trained weights, seeding it with the planet Earth, and then filling out the sentence with the GPT-2 model. It's a really great resource for getting a better sense of how this language model works and how to implement it in PyTorch. From Google's AI blog, we'll look at this DermGAN model, improving the skin cancer classification with deep convolutional networks by using generative adversarial networks in order to augment the training data set such that it can account for more uh, skin types, different skin conditions, and different camera conditions such that the uh, model performs better on rare cases like melanoma detection. We'll also look at subclass distillation, a really interesting new technique for knowledge distillation, especially in cases with binary classification where the teacher only predicts two class labels so without the subclass distillation, it doesn't really provide much signal to the student network. Subclass distillation tasks the teacher to invent subclasses with a contrast of loss in order to provide more feedback signal to the student network. We'll also look at the study from MIT predicting how well neural networks will scale, constructing these uh, empirical functions based on predicting how well the neural networks are gonna scale up with respect to data set size and model parameters. Then we'll look at the CodeBert model, combining programming languages and natural language to improve performance on tasks like uh, giving a natural language query like how to uh, construct a REST API with Django or Node.js or something like that, and then finding the corresponding code to answer the natural language queries. This paper introduces a new uh, way of training these models with this kind of a replaced token detection objective, as well as the mass language modeling to combine the programming languages and the natural languages in the BERT framework. Then from the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence, we'll look at the Rover framework, the uh, web app, transformers as soft reasoners over language, constructing these data sets that have this artificial reasoning task and seeing how well the transformers mimic the input output of reasoning systems. Then we'll look at the automatic shortcut removal for self-supervised representation learning, avoiding these uh, constraints where you have these self-supervised learning tasks like rotation prediction or colorization, and the uh, corresponding model just learns to exploit these kind of high frequency details like chromatic aberration in order to perform this task rather than learning actual semantic representations useful for transfer learning or what have you. So this paper introduces a new technique of having this adversarial uh, transformation that makes the task harder and produces more semantic representations for downstream models trained on these self-supervised learning tasks. Then we'll look at Torch Meta, a new version of kind of like OpenAI Gym, but for meta learning, things like the uh, few shot omniglot classification and miscellaneous uh, different of these uh, meta learning tasks that are implemented in this library, and as well as different meta learning algorithms that you can interface to start uh, having this framework, this gym for doing meta learning. Then we'll look at this great blog post, a deep dive into the reformer, explaining some of the details behind the new reformer transformer architecture, like locality sensitive hashing and how it's used to save this memory computation bottleneck, as well as the difference between gradient checkpointing and these reversible neural network layers. We'll also look at the molecule attention transformer, a really interesting uh, transformer architecture that's used to predict properties of molecules by uh, transforming this attention layer to include things like the adjacency matrix and the distance between atoms. A really interesting paper extending these ideas into more domains like predicting the properties of a molecule. We'll also look at why I'm excited about multi-agent reinforcement learning, a really great overview about multi-agent reinforcement learning and reasons why it's interesting to study. We'll also look at this interesting blog post beyond BERT, looking at different characteristics of what has fueled advances in natural language processing, like different training objectives like self-supervised learning and language modeling for these uh, natural language processing models, as well as the data sets and the evaluation metrics and other miscellaneous things with respect to the future of transformer models. The 2010s, our decade of deep learning outlook on the 2020s is another great overview of miscellaneous things in deep learning and predictions for the future of 2020s, like uh, data markets and privacy and AI and things like real world AI and AI that's inventing its own tasks and data sets. We'll also look at the fundamentals of uh, NLP from Dare slash AI, going over tokenization, lemmatization, stemming, and sentence segmentation in a new series going through natural language processing fundamentals. We'll also give a brief overview of this MIT technology review piece on OpenAI, uh, some, of the, some of the different ways that they paint the OpenAI picture, and the details about uh, this article. This weekly update will also cover articles from NVIDIA, like Deep Six speeding up the search of patients for clinical trial studies, particularly when they're uh, developing these drugs, they're target patients with these uh, particular uh, genetic mutations. We'll also look at NVIDIA's uh, six smart robots at GTC 2020, describing different smart robots that are being used and implemented at the GTC 2020 conference. We'll also look at their article on retail and AI, things like recommendation inference speedups, uh, these conversational AI bots and how they're being used in retail and asset protection. We'll also look at the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence's newsletter for February, 
and then we'll look at the uh, Dare slash AI NLP newsletter, which is a really great overview of different areas in deep learning and natural language processing. This week, a really great blog post came out, the annotated GPT-2. So similar to the Harvard NLP, the annotated transformer, where they go through the paper, attention is all you need, and show you how to implement the original transformer architecture in PyTorch, the annotated GPT-2 goes through the GPT-2 paper and shows you how to implement this decoder-only transformer using PyTorch. So the article begins by going through the uh, paper GPT-2, some recommended resources for understanding attention, and starting off with this diagram. So this diagram shows the GPT architecture. Basically what we're doing is we're implementing this uh, self-attention, the feed-forward layers, the convolutions to project the uh, query key and value matrices, and then we're gonna be repeating this decoder block 12 times to form the GPT-2 architecture. So you start off by importing the libraries, then you implement the, com the one-dimensional convolution that you use in order to project these key query and value matrices for input into the attention layer. Uh, it describes why you use the convolution, the one-dimensional convolution in order to do this projection. Then it goes on to the feed forward layer that's used after the attention layer in that uh, diagram above showing you the overall architecture, this feed forward layer. Then it goes into the implementation of attention, different things you do in PyTorch to build out this layer. Then the uh, overall construction of the transformer decoder block, this uh, decoder block that takes in the overall uh, text and position embeddings and then maps it into the next uh, intermediate state of representations for the GPT-2 model. And then the uh, article goes into building the whole GPT-2 model. And then an example where you load pre-trained weights, use the uh, Hugging Face GPT-2 tokenizer, and then seed the model with the planet Earth, and then look at what the uh, GPT-2 model will finish the sentence with by training with the language modeling task. So I also recommend these other links, the Illustrated GPT-2 from Jay Almar, uh, the Hugging Face Transformers example of how to use this, and then also how to train a new language model from scratch using transformers and tokenizers. Google's AI blog has posted about a really interesting study on using data from generative adversarial networks, particularly data from these image-to-image -image translation GANs like uh, pix to pix or PsychoGAN or these kinds of like the recent Ganilla model to do this image-to-image -image translation in order to produce more training data for training these models. So in this case, they're looking at skin cancer classification with deep convolutional neural networks. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to vary the data set based on these combinatorial subgroups uh, described in the blog post as uh, sufficient skin type A, skin condition B, taken by camera C. So what they want to do is they want to use the uh, generative adversarial network to create realistic data that results in more diversity in the different skin types, different skin conditions, and the miscellaneous lighting factors of the camera. So what they do is they map this semantic uh, pixel map into the generated images of the uh, skin conditions. It's interesting to think of this analogy with respect to things like Galgan that map from this semantic pixel map into these photorealistic images. So in this paper, they use the pix to pix architecture, which is this interesting image-to-image -image translation model that has the L1 reconstruction loss as well as the adversarial loss. So you can see some examples of the generated skin condition images that they use to supplement their training set in the blog post. So in their paper, uh, DermGAN, you can see some of the examples of the results of doing this and the miscellaneous FID scores, which is this automated metric in order to evaluate the quality of these generated images. You see that the real data has an FID score of 83.6, and the derm GAN gets pretty close to it with 122.4. Another interesting uh, study on this is classification accuracy score for conditional generative models, where they look at trying to see how uh, these data points from generative adversarial networks can be used to train image classifiers evaluated on real test data. So it's definitely a really interesting case of using these generative adversarial networks in order to have a more diverse data set, in order to account for more uh, rare conditions, different types of lighting and miscellaneous things like this. You can see the results of augmenting the training data it gets a better performance on the rare skin condition cases like melanoma detection. One of my personal projects that I think is really interesting with respect to DermGAN is this slam dunk video classification, where you want to crop out the uh, dunk images, things like the highest point in the jump, from these videos. So using things like the DermGAN, where you're augmenting the data set by having this semantic map and then varying miscellaneous factors, would allow me to do things like have uh, different people in the dunk frames, uh, different gyms, different lighting conditions, or other things like shifting the where the basket is, and the different things that you can use by moving these semantic maps around. So I think it's really interesting to think of what you can do with this image-to-image -image data augmentation with the generative adversarial networks in order to make these, uh, you know, to have this prior knowledge into these uh, image classifiers or these different image co computer vision models so that it can account for more diverse scenarios. Following the recent SimCLR self-supervised contrastive learning framework presented by Jeff Hinton as well from Google Brain, we now have this week's subclass distillation. So subclass distillation builds on the idea of knowledge distillation 
by introducing additional classes for the teacher network to further distill its knowledge into the student network. So take the problem of binary classification in which the teacher network only produces uh, predictions over two classes. This doesn't give much uh, signal for the student network to learn from the teacher network. So rather what they do is they introduce this contrastive learning loss that encourages the teacher to uh, distribute its uh, predictions into these different subclasses and then it can use this subclass in order to train the student network. So in the experiments, you, they uh, construct this CFAR 2x5 data set where they cluster the different classes into a binary classification task and they show how the subclass distillation can learn to automatically separate these original classes. They also show that this results in faster training and they further experiment on the Celeb A data set showing that it can discover these subclasses inherent in the data set. And they also experiment on this uh, click prediction data set where there are uh, no known subclasses natural in the data set. It's a really interesting extension to the knowledge distillation framework by showing how you can use this contrastive loss in order to provide more signal from the teacher into the student in the knowledge distillation pipeline. This week, a paper came out from MIT's computer science and AI lab predicting how well neural networks will scale. So basically trying to construct these functions that will predict how well neural networks are expected to scale up with respect to adding more data and more model parameters. So this idea is about uh, seeing exactly what might happen if we say go in 100x our data set size or 100x the number of parameters. So obviously it's a valuable uh, kind of study and having these kind of functions so you have a sense of what the error might be if you scale up the models because right now it's largely unknown what might really happen with respect to adding more data and model, uh, model size, although you just assume that it will result in a better model. So in their study, in their paper, a construction prediction of generalization error across scales, they uh, do these empirical performances where they... Uh, experiment across varying these scales of model parameters, scales of data set sizes, and they discover this relationship, this power law relationship between the data set size and the model size, and they construct these functions in order to relate them with another, finally tying them into this function that accounts for the uh, error that just can't be modeled in the data set, and then the sort of expectation of the model size and the data set size, so you can have a sense of predicting uh, how the model will perform with respect to scaling up these two factors of data set size and model size. OpenAI has produced a similar paper, Scaling Laws for Neural Language Models, where they find that larger models are uh, significantly more sample efficient and than the uh, smaller models. So basically saying if you have more model parameters, you don't need as much data to train that model as a smaller model, which is an interesting finding. And they produce uh, more of these findings uh, described in the paper about miscellaneous things that they learn with respect to uh, training these massive deep neural networks on massive data sets. We've seen a lot of interesting extensions of BERT that try to combine BERT with these multimodalities, things like images and text like image BERT or VilBERT, uh, video and text like the video BERT model, and these other things like multilingual models that say combine uh, like French and English text in the BERT model. So this model is code BERT, which is combining programming languages and natural languages for applications like uh, code search. So you can see examples of code search where you type in things like how do I write a REST API in uh, Django or Node.js, something like that, and you want to be able to search with natural language and get code as a return. So this is the idea of the code search net challenge and miscellaneous other things that are looking to bridge this gap between natural language queries and then searching for the corresponding code. So what they do in uh, CodeBert, they have this input-output representation of formulating the CLS token that's used to classify the sequence in the BERT model, then the natural language, the separator token, and the corresponding code in this uh, given data point. So the pre-training data, they have these pairs of like commented code and the annotated code that describes what it does with different languages like Go, Java, JavaScript, PHP, Python, Ruby, and all in all they have about 2 million uh, bimodal data pairs and 6.4 million unimodal codes which is unimodal describes where you only have the code. So they describe how they uh, do the mass language modeling with the unimodal data, and then with the bimodal data, they construct this uh, replace token detection objective. So what they use is they, uh, they produce these two, the natural language generator and the code generator. They mass the tokens, and then the code generator produces a replacement for the mass token, and then they train this discriminator model to tell what was the original and what was the originally masked out. So it might be tough for the code discriminator to tell what was replaced after it's been replaced with the sample from the generator models. This week, a really interesting paper came out from the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence that explores how well transformers can perform the reasoning task. So in this case, they're looking at transformers as soft theorem provers, meaning that they can mimic the input-output of a reasoning system. So they construct this initial data set where they define these conditions, and they have this rule of condition and condition asterisks, which is like this regular expression term that means you can repeat this on and on, so like condition and condition and condition and condition, and then conclusion. So they define this data set, things like Bob is big, Bob is round, and then kind of uh, like the conclusions, if someone is round and big, then they are blue. So they construct this artificial data set, and they see how well the transformer can perform these uh, reasoning questions based on taking in this kind of a data set as input. 
So this data set is very formally defined in like is big, uh, big people are rough, and then these conditions. So if someone is a bit round and big, then they are blue. So this is more of a formal reasoning, but now they want to see the linguistic analog where they have this data set in a more natural languagely defined kind of way. So what they do is they have the uh, crowdsourcing, but they have people paraphrase that original data set. So instead of something like Bob is cold, it's now in the snow sits Bob crying from being cold. So it's more natural language that the uh, transformer has to learn to extract the facts in order to do this kind of uh, reasoning task. In their paper, they show that this performs well by doing the paraphrase language and then having the transformer model answer these questions about the data set that requires this kind of fact chaining in the data set. So they also explore uh, having a different uh, depth of the fact chaining that's required in the training set compared to the test set. So for example, something like Bob is big, big people are round, uh, round people are happy. That requires uh, depth two chaining to say uh, Bob is happy because you go from Bob is big, uh, big is round, uh, round is happy, or maybe three depth. So the idea here is that you can train with less depth than you test and the model still performs pretty well, which is an interesting kind of way of uh, structuring these artificially constructed data sets. So they provide this uh, web app, Rover, where you can uh, give the model a set of facts and rules and then ask it questions about the facts and rules you give it. So in this case, uh, Arthur can fly is true because you say Arthur is a bird, but you can say this uh, case of seeing how you can do this for interpretability, where you say Arthur is uh, not a bird, and then see how that changes the transformer's predictions on the uh, questions based on the facts and rules that it's given. So you see in this case of uh, perturbing these things, and now it says that it's false that Arthur can fly because Arthur is not a bird, and how that might uh, allow for more interpretability with these question answering models. So what they do is they take these data sets and they search for the sentences that they can perturb in order to produce a new prediction from the model. So it might be interesting to see this with things like the Stanford question answering data set to explore which of these sentences you can uh, change or negate, say like uh, Southern California, not often abbreviated SoCal or something like that, just to see how it changes the question answering. Maybe that kind of perturbation of the sentences can produce more of this interpretability in these question answering models. Self-supervised learning is one of the hottest paradigms in training deep neural networks because of the way that you can construct these supervised learning tasks from unlabeled data. Some of these self-supervised learning tasks include things like rotating images and predicting the rotation angle, or uh, converting an image to the grayscale counterpart and then predicting the RGB version of it. But self-supervised learning like colorization or rotation prediction may not learn actual semantic representations of images that are useful for transfer into downstream tasks like image net classification or object detection or whatever because of imaging artifacts like chromatic aberration that allow the image, uh, the self-supervised learning task, to take advantage of these kind of low-level, high-frequency details of the image in order to perform the self-supervised learning task like predicting the rotation angle. So the idea behind this paper, automatic shortcut removal for self-supervised representation learning, is to have an adversarial trained uh, sort of like image image to image translation model that preprocesses the images to make the self-supervised learning task harder. So the lens output takes in this input image and then tries to produce an image that makes the uh, task of predicting the rotation angle harder. So basically it can't exploit these uh, high frequency features that aren't semantically useful for downstream tasks. So you can see how this improves the performance of these uh, models when they're then uh, fine tuned for image net classification. You see the baseline of rotation has 46.6% accuracy compared to a gain of about 2% when using this lens filter in order to make the uh, images better for uh, the self-supervised learning task. This week in AI, Torch Meta was released, a meta learning library for PyTorch. So this library is similar to how the OpenAI gym with things like these cart pole balancing or the bipedal walker makes it easier to have this environment to interface with reinforce and learning control algorithms. This is a similar kind of a gym environment for these meta learning algorithms. So this video shows you how to install it, uh, do the mini ImageNet five-way classification where you only have five instances of the image and then you need to classify it, and then this MAML-style meta-learning algorithm that's implemented with the library. So you can see some of the examples of the different data sets that are included in the uh, meta-learning gym in the Torch Meta Library. So one example of this is the OmniGlot data set. So this is this case of one-shot classification. So this kind of uh, one-shot learning is where you get one example of the image, like this one or this one, and then you got to classify a new image that is similar to this one. So in this case, uh, this image, maybe this one is the one that's similar or something like that. And in this one, maybe more obviously, this one is the one that corresponds with this. So this is a case of uh, Omniglot and this kind of few shot classification task where you get uh, a limited number of samples of a given class and you need to classify it in the future. So meta learning is the idea of leveraging knowledge from other tasks to get better insight into the other tasks. So you see some of the models that they've implemented for you in the Torch Meta that you can play with sort of similar to how you have the reinforcement learning algorithms that interface with the OpenAI uh, gym environment. 
So you can see the uh, GitHub page for the Torch Meta Library, uh, an explanation of meta learning from few shot learning to rapid reinforcement learning, and then the course page, uh, CS330, Z Multitasking and Meta Learning. I don't remember where I heard this from, but I think that these lectures are gonna be open source soon as well on like YouTube uh, with the different lectures from this course. Another really interesting article that came out this week is a deep dive into the Reformer. The Reformer is this new transformer architecture from uh, Google Brain that has this kind of a uh, like the full attention approximation by doing this locality sensitive hashing. So the blog post begins by describing self attention where you have this matrix multiplication between the queries and the keys, softmax normalization, and then multiplied by the value matrix. So it starts off by projecting the query key and value matrices by uh, multiplying them by this one dimensional convolution. Uh, then what you do is you have the query key matrix multiplication. And the big bottleneck of this is that you have this L squared uh, memory of the key query uh, multiplication. So you're multiplying the key times the query and the result is you have this massive intermediate memory as a result of the uh, dot product attention between the queries and the keys. So the idea here is to first get rid of this idea of a query and a key, rather we're just gonna have keys and keys, and then you have the, uh, the reformer implements this uh, locality sensitive hashing in order to improve on the matrix multiplication between keys and keys. So the idea behind LSH to compute similarity is that what you're doing with dot product attention and then putting it through this soft max normalization is small values aren't gonna contribute at all in the final output that gets matrix multiplied with the value matrix. So the idea here is to do this locality sensitive hashing to only have uh, similar vectors even go into that matrix multiplication. So the idea here is that you use this uh, quick hashing technique to see which vectors are similar in the key key uh, multiplication. And then this is how you pass it in and save that L squared uh, memory. So then describe how you have this sequence length of 64,000 in, uh, in the reformer architecture. And this requires a lot of memory in order to hold. So one idea of doing this is gradient checkpointing. So gradient checkpointing described in this diagram is where you kind of like save the gradients and then you will recompute the whole thing in order to get back to it in terms of the back propagation. So another contribution to uh, the reformer is the use of reversible uh, nets, so these reversible layers. So what they do basically is they define the layers in such a way that you can recompute the activations in the backward pass with uh, by splitting the kind of output, like Y1 and Y2, and you can split it by like uh, the first, say, 64 features can be used to compute Y2 in this kind of a way in order to uh, avoid having to do gradient checkpointing. So it's a really interesting article that gives a great explanation of the reformer, and they also recommend checking out uh, the GitHub repository implementing the reformer. Another interesting paper that came out this week is the Molecule Attention Transformer. So the paper begins by describing how an estimated 85% of drug candidates fail the clinical trials after a long and costly development process, and they want to develop these models that can predict the properties of a molecule, like toxicity or bioactivity. So they describe the molecule attention transformer. So what they do is they have the self-attention between this featureized of the uh, atoms and the molecule. They have the adjacency matrix connecting the atoms, and they have the distance between the atoms, all implemented in this kind of a novel function with respect to the way that you blend the query key transpose uh, kind of attention operation with the uh, distance matrix and the adjacency matrix. They also describe how they featureize the atoms for input into the self-attention layer. So it's definitely a really interesting kind of way of seeing how you can extend these ideas like transformers into other ideas like these uh, molecule property prediction. Definitely a really interesting paper. Why I'm excited about uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning is a really interesting blog post from a research scientist heading into OpenAI's uh, Scholars Program. So the blog post begins by describing what multi-agent reinforcement learning is, where you have these uh, cooperative agents or competitive agents, and they're interacting with each other in this environment. Things like the OpenAI hide-and-seek environment. So two reasons why uh, the research scientists are excited about multi-agent reinforcement learning is human intelligence is very social. Uh, an interesting uh, quote from this is about how uh, remarkable progress humanity has made since then has been due to social cultural development and accumulation of knowledge rather than improvements to the human brain, describing how we have this language to communicate with one another. Another interesting thing is about how multi-agent reinforcement learning could be a useful tool for understanding how AI will impact society by seeing how these reinforcement learning agents interact with one another. There's really interesting uh, blog post, including with a study plan and a bunch of different uh, resources to learn more about multi-agent reinforcement learning. John Bird is a really interesting blog post describing different predictions about transformers in 2020. So the first of which is describing the uh, 2019 advancements, things like crediting the learning paradigm, as well as the kind of different model designs. So in addition to just kind of these ideas of GPT-2 and these decoder only transformer blocks, the transformer XL, like augmenting the uh, transformer with this recurrence memory me mechanism, you also see how we have this distillation and other techniques that are improving the learning signal 
for these uh, neural language models. So crediting self-supervision and language modeling as the general purpose training signal that is really credited for much of the advancement in natural language processing in 2020. So the blog post also describes a lot of different tasks and data sets that are making it better to train natural language processing models. Things like the uh, question answering, explained to me like I'm five data set, the uh, superglue benchmark, the uh, PG-19 data set from DeepMind, PG-19 language modeling benchmark that came out with the compressive transformer model. And then other things like understanding what's happening with these models, interesting papers like what does BERT look at, attention is not an explanation, and revealing the dark secrets of BERT as looking at, you know, exploring kind of what is happening, what kind of representations are being learned of language in these models. So it's definitely a really interesting blog post describing different details of transformers and natural language processing heading into 2020. This week in AI, Eugen Schmidhuber posted a really interesting article on the 2010s in deep learning and outlook on the 2020s. So the blog post begins by describing the long short-term memory network and the miscellaneous impacts that it's had on handwriting recognition, uh, speech recognition, uh, other things like uh, machine translation, robotics, and video games. The blog post then goes on to describe uh, feedforward networks like these convolutional neural networks on static data and miscellaneous other advancements of applying feedforward networks to static data types. So we've also seen uh, things like GANs, uh, this kind of uh, adversarial uh, curiosity principle, the idea of having dueling neural networks that train each other, and other ideas like reinforced learning, meta-learning, uh, world models, distillation, neural architecture search, all these other ideas and miscellaneous research papers coming from uh, their lab at researching deep learning. So then some of the predictions for the uh, 2020s start with the future of data markets and privacy, describing how people will be able to uh, get paid for things like sensitive medical data, for miscellaneous other things where you're selling your data, with, rather than just having kind of like a surveillance system that just takes your data from you, or this kind of a system. So then the blog post describes uh, what might happen in the 2020s, uh, predicting that more real AI will happen, and these interesting cases of things like the POET algorithm, or maybe generative uh, teaching networks, where these uh, neural networks and these kind of AI systems are actively creating its own data through its own self-invented uh, experiments. It's definitely an interesting blog post worth reading about miscellaneous things in deep learning. Dare slash AI has published the first in a series of the fundamentals of natural language processing. This collab notebook shows miscellaneous fundamentals of natural language processing, starting off with this idea of tokenization and how you split sentences up into individual tokens that go into these natural language processing models. Then the blog post describes uh, lemmatization, which is where you do things like reduce uh, coding into code and writing into write, things like writes into write, and miscellaneous things into the base form is the idea of lemmatization. Then the blog post describes uh, stemming, which is where you would uh, do things like argue would get reduced to argue. So it's more of a more like argue just A-R-G-U rather than having the E at the end. This kind of morphological analysis, a different way of looking at how you can process text for natural language processing models. Another which is sentence segmentation, where you're splitting sentences up and then describing the limitations of if you want to split sentences up with things like doctor, where you have DR period, and numbers like 0 0.4. So it's a great uh, first introduction into natural language processing, concepts of tokenization, lemmatization, stemming, and sentence segmentation, as well as some further references to read about these topics. So it's definitely an interesting series that I'm looking forward to keeping up with. This week, the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence published a newsletter about miscellaneous things that they've been up to in February 2020. So the newsletter begins by describing the AAAI Outstanding Paper Award, the Winnow Grand looking to uh, refine the Winnow Grand uh, Winnow Grad Schema Challenge and make this data set harder and include samples that don't rely on miscellaneous things like having the uh, predators and lion that simply because they're associated more with each other, it has this undesirable result in the language models trained on this data set and evaluated on this challenge. Then describe the XNOR.AI company acquired by Apple, the uh, RoboThor Challenge, which is really interesting, uh, simulated in real environments that have been open source for doing this kind of uh, navigation task. And then we've seen uh, the Allen Institute uh, Incubator, $10 million fund to uh, develop these our artificial intelligence companies. And then we're this out of the news like uh, different stories and the new uh, break benchmark where they're trying to decompose these questions into these kind of like uh, semantic trees that can be used to answer the questions. Definitely an interesting newsletter from the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence. DeepMind has released the Haiku library for building neural networks on top of the JAX framework, as well as the RELAX framework, a library for building these reinforcement learning networks on top of the JAX framework. So described well in this uh, blog post and towards data science is about what is the JAX library and what are these libraries. So JAX is this kind of like uh, NumPy with Autograd that's being used, it's becoming increasingly popular. I've seen a lot about this and I'm really excited to look at this for myself and get more familiar with this. So this Haiku library uh, makes it easier to build these neural networks with JAX, as well as the Relax uh, library makes it easier to do these reinforcement learning tasks with the JAX library. So it's definitely interesting, something to keep your eye on is the development of this JAX library for building neural networks.
This week in AI, MIT Technology Review posted a kind of takedown style article against OpenAI. So in this article, they discussed miscellaneous things about OpenAI, like their decision to move from a nonprofit in order to aggregate resources to support their uh, kind of theory of scaling up these models like GPT-2 with 1.5 billion parameters, and how they've moved into a profit capped at 100x return. And the article cites how this 100x return thing is a sort of a funny thing that Google investors had returned 20x, and that uh, some Reddit comment that cites that and saying that kind of this 100x uh, capped return is sort of a laughable thing. So they kind of paint OpenAI like an AI-obsessed cult, describing things like how Greg Brockman, uh, one of the founders of OpenAI, has like an OpenAI logo arranged in flowers at uh, his wedding. And they kind of, in this article, describe more things, trying to make it seem like they're like kind of like a, I don't know, obsessed with this kind of thing in an unhealthy way. But they describe how their approach to AGI, they have these two paradigms and different camps of having these diverse approaches to it about scaling up the models, uh, papers that they've approached, like uh, posted like the scaling laws for neural language models and how they require this resource aggregation to kind of approach that philosophy of achieving AGI. The article also describes about the GPT-2 sort of like publicity stunt almost, which I think is warranted, that, although, where they describe how they kind of did this thing where they announced that, you know, the model might be too dangerous to release. And some people will say, well, you know, that they were kind of full of themselves, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's definitely an interesting kind of discussion that they included. And then they also describe how they have this lack of diversity in the company. So if you're interested in this article, I think it's also interesting to kind of read like the uh, Reddit discussion and see how people are reacting to this article. From NVIDIA's AI and Deep Learning blog is a discussion about how Deep6 is speeding up search for clinical studies, particularly when they're uh, developing a drug that's targeting patients with a specific rare genetic mutation, and how this company, Deep6, as a part of the NVIDIA Inception Accelerator program, is accelerating finding patients for these clinical trials. NVIDIA's AI blog also descri uh, describes smart robots at GTC 2020, things like a robotic dog that sniffs out trouble in complex environments, uh, like uh, luggage carrying robots, uh, robots that take inventory, and all these different things that are being presented at GTC with these smart robots. NVIDIA's AI blog also discusses uh, the retail industry's use of AI, things like uh, smart stores, operations, supply chain optimization, uh, view the customer, describing things like uh, recommendation inference, like Alibaba's recommendation engine, uh, Domino's inference engine, and how they're speeding up recommendation inference, but things like the Tensor RT library, also things like conversational AI, and this kind of asset protection done with uh, deep learning and AI, as well as linking to tutorials to learn about things like Rapids and different uh, TensorRT and other things with respect to NVIDIA's deep learning stack. TensorFlow's YouTube channel has concluded a series on neural structured learning and begun a new series on natural language processing and tokenization in the zero to hero uh, style. So it starts by describing how uh, if you transform these uh, two words into numbers, silent and listen are gonna be equivalently represented. So then it describes this code use transform sentences like I love my dog and I love my cat into uh, like this dictionary of tokens using the Keras tokenizer API and the exact syntax for how you do that and then the resulting dictionary that comes from doing that kind of tokenization. It's definitely an interesting series that I'm excited to follow up with. This week another edition of the NLP newsletter from Dare.ai which is my personal favorite newsletter for uh, keeping up with deep learning and these miscellaneous advancements came out. So it starts off with a publication uh, understanding of self distillation this kind of uh, distillation paradigm the uh, post from Jürgen Schmidt-Huber on the decade of deep learning and outlook on 2020s, using neural networks to solve advanced mathematical equations, doing things like symbolic integration with these sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, neural networks, and then miscellaneous tools like the Ganilla model as doing this kind of image-to-image -image translation in a novel way, and then looking at uh, Andrew Wang and his interview with uh, Lex Fridman, talking about his interest in self-supervised learning, and the SIM-CLR model, which is the latest advancement in this kind of contrastive self-supervised learning framework compared to things like contrast of predictive coding and momentum contrast, and other self-supervised learning techniques like the big bygan or the rotation self-supervised learning task. Other things included are like the JAX libraries, which is gaining a lot of momentum, DeepMind's Haiku and Relax library on top of this, making it easier to use, the Spark Wiki library for processing Wikipedia data, miscellaneous other things like the tokenizers, uh, ethical considerations, the annotated GPT-2, which is a really awesome blog post describing how to implement the GPT-2 model in uh, PyTorch and using these pre-trained weights and giving an example with proceeding with something like the planet Earth and showing you how the GPT-2 can finish that sentence. Further articles like Beyond Bird, uh, Matrix Compression Operator from TensorFlow's blog, uh, different educational resources like Dare.ai's uh, Fundamentals of NLP that we went through in this video, and this lines other things like book recommendations, TinyML, uh, Deep Learning for Coders with FastAI and PyTorch, and other noteworthy mentions like the Torch Meta Library, which I think is super interesting, and other things like uh, machinery-involved language modeling, and the MIT Introduction to Deep Learning course.
So definitely a really great newsletter that I highly recommend subscribing to and checking out. Yana Kelcher has also just uploaded a YouTube explanation of deep learning for symbolic mathematics, explaining how sequence-to-sequence -sequence models do this kind of symbolic integration that I highly recommend checking out if you're interested in this.